how I get set up here. Just show of hands, how many people here are students? Raise your hands high so I can see it. I can't see all the way back. Okay. How many people just have a best interest in publishing research in informatics? <laughs> Some. Okay. So, so there's an interesting thing. So, so Evan's working in this like white hot area of computational phenotyping, and some of the work that he was presenting is really just the absolute internationally leading stuff in phenotyping. So if you're interested in what he said, you totally should go talk to him, just a sales pitch for him. <laughs> I, I do want to expose just a little bit of the irony, though. We're saying that the hardest problem in informatics is using an electronic medical record system to figure out what disease people have. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> um, so. I'm going to do something a little bit risky here, and Evan, you just need to tell me when to shut up. So don't uh, worry about the it. time here. We're, we're going to keep things a little bit informal if it's okay with everybody here. Maybe it allows a bit more of a forum for discussion, so I will not. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, um, I prepared a talk, and then I just threw out about half of it because I wanted to actually react to things that Ian and Evan said. So um, let's do that. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Observational Health Data Science and Informatics Collaborative, or Odyssey. Uh, and it's important just to define what the term odyssey means. It means a long journey full of adventures or a series of experiences that give knowledge or understanding to someone. And specifically what we're going to talk about right now is the journey of how do we learn from electronic uh, health record data and administrative claims data. And um, we're all here because we're excited about the potential and the, the possibilities of all the cool things we could do. It's also super important for us to, for us to recognize the challenges and limitations and some of the things that have actually gotten in, in the way historically so that we can learn and grow from them. And so I'm going to take you on a little bit of an ups and downs of different examples, both good, bad, and indifferent, <coughs> to hopefully just uh, shed a little bit of light and hopefully get you a little bit excited about why this could be important for you. So let's start on some of the lows. I want to talk about what the current uh, quality of evidence is in observational research. Uh, specifically, I'm going to show you a few examples in the, the space of drug safety surveillance. So thinking about what, what pharmaceutical products might have side effects. This is a paper that was published in JAMA using the, uh, the, the CPRD database, which is the same database that Ian showed a lot of his work on. Uh, in, this, in this paper, what they, they showed in August of 2010 was that when they studied uh, the UK electronic health record data, they found that oral bisphosphonates were not associated with esophageal cancer. So that's good if you're taking, uh, taking one of these drugs. You probably don't want to have gastric cancer. Only problem was in the British Medical Journal, another very highly esteemed uh, journal, there was another paper published one month later that used the exact same data and concluded that there's a statistically significant <laughs> increased risk of esophageal cancer associated with the use of bisphosphonates. So whether you like JAMA or BMJ, whether you like researchers on one side of the pond or the other, We've got a problem here, okay? Unfortunately, that's not just the only example of this happening. This actually can happen quite a lot. Here's an article from JAMA that said that the oral fluoroquinolones increased the risk of retinal detachment. And they did this study of um, uh, data. Um, actually, this one was done in Canada, so yay to you guys. <laughs> uh, and you found that uh, um, oral fluoroquinolones increased the risk of developing retinal detachment. So maybe we should take notice since Fluoroquinolones are used by um, millions of patients every single day. Problem was, the same journal, just one year later, published a different observational database study from a different data source, and they concluded that oral fluoroquinolones do not increase the risk of retinal detachment. So, same journal giving us two different opinions based on asking the same question, just of two different databases. Uh, pioglitazone, a drug for diabetes, uh, there's been a lot of question about whether or not it increase the risk of bladder cancer. And this journal, the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology in May of 2012, used the CPRD database that Ian was talking about and found that pioglitazone does not appear to uh, significantly associated with the increased risk. The problem was BMJ, exact same month, exact same data, <laughs> said that pioglitazone isn't associated with an increased risk. So how the heck are we supposed to use any of this stuff? Now, thankfully, there are things like government agencies who are creating national systems, and that's clearly going to solve the problem, right? <laughs> uh, in the US, uh, the, the FDA has established the Sentinel Initiative, which is a network of administrative claims data for purposes of drug safety surveillance. And one of their first landmark papers was this published, published paper where they looked at uh, dabigatran and the increased risk of bleeding. This is a, an anticoagulant that's brought to the market. 
And what they published was that they, they actually issued a risk communication about this based on doing an analysis that was an unadjusted cohort analysis where they basically said, it looks pretty good, abigatrin doesn't seem to increase the risk of bleeding. Now, it turns out one of the funded investigators, the academics that was participating in Sentinel, published a commentary in circulation a little bit afterwards and his interpretation of the results that he participated in was that the absence of adjustment for a possible confounding and the paucity of actual data made this analysis unsuitable for informing the care of patients. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, and, and worse yet, in, then JAMA Internal Medicine published a paper where they actually said, okay, enough's enough, we've got to figure out, does the observational results actually match up to the clinical trial? And unfortunately, what they found was that the results from the mini Sentinel pro program and the randomized clinical trials yielded completely opposite results. So, um, yeah, we could all pack up and go home. Uh, or we could think about what do we learn from these experiences and what do we do? So the hype about big data is real. Like, there's lots of data. There's got to be stuff that we can do. We also have to be clear that with all that hype, there's lots of possibilities for us to do things wrong. And these examples are just happening pretty much on a, on, a, on a weekly basis here. So what's the core problem? Well, the problem is that we've got lots of data that we're all super excited to learn from, but we actually have very little evidence that we can actually trust. And the challenge is how do we translate data and turn it into evidence where that evidence is actually accurate and actionable? So um, uh, I'll, I'll just tell aside. side. Uh, how many people have seen uh, uh, Woody Allen's Annie Hall? Show of hands. Okay, at the start, there's this monologue where he talks about um, uh, two people go up to the Catskills for a resort and they're talking about their day and they're lamenting on their experience at the restaurant. And one person says, um, man, the food was just horrible. And the other person says, I know, and the portions were so small. <laughs> so, <laughs> takes a little second. <laughs> so, so I want you to think about that in the context of healthcare. So the problem with all those studies I showed is that that's quote unquote evidence. Those are published papers in the best journals in the world and people are trying to make decisions even though that information is junk. The good <laughs> news is we haven't actually generated all that much evidence yet. <laughs> what I'm showing you here is actually an analysis that uh, uh, colleagues of mine have done looking at the published literature about drug safety surveillance. Uh, and what you're looking at is on the x-axis, I'm showing you all the drugs that are marketed uh, in the United States. On the y-axis, or on the X, across the top, I'm showing you all health outcomes of interest. Those little red dots represent situations where there's at least one published paper that associates that drug to that outcome, whether the paper says that there is a positive association or a negative association or just unequivocal evidence. Now, if, if those of you in the back, you're squinting, you're like, where are these red dots he's talking about? That's because there's actually a point to that. It actually turns out that only about 4% of all drugs and all outcomes have a published paper that gives us evidence. Greater than 90% of questions about drugs and outcomes, there is no published evidence one way or the other to tell us whether the drug causes the side effect, whether the drug is protective of the side effect, or whether there's no relationship one, the, one way or the other. Okay. So one of the reasons we should be excited and hyped about big data opportunities is because if we keep following our old school paradigm of having one researcher with one data set come up with one hypothesis to publish one paper that one other researcher is going to refute anyway and publish it and put one little red dot on here, we're never going to solve this healthcare problem. Because no matter what treatment you're taking, you might want to know, tell me the evidence about all the things that might happen to me. And for greater than 90% of the questions, the answer is we just don't know. So we have to think differently about ways of paradigms for exploring the data. So we've got to be able to fill in this gap and think differently to, uh, to do that. So one of the things that we had done uh, in, in earlier research was we were asked the question, how much can we learn from observational data? Those papers that I showed you, how often does that actually happen? Did I just cherry pick really bad examples or is this more uh, an exception to the rule? And some of the things that we learned through the course of a series of methodologic experiments was that um, there's tremendous database heterogeneity, the heterogeneity. If I run the same exact analysis on two different databases, there's a pretty high likelihood that I'm going to be able to observe different results, whether one says there's an increase and one says there's no effect or vice versa. This gets to Jim's comment about how do we know that databases can be combined. Short answer, they shouldn't be. You should actually look at every database as being a, a different lens into the world. We also learned that if you have the same database but apply two different methods to the same question, it's highly likely that you might get different results. And so choices that we make as analysts actually matter quite a lot. The third thing we, we observed is that statistics 
the thing that we hold dear, uh, uh, Huda mentioned uh, the p-value, uh, the 95% confidence interval, they don't actually, they're not actually correct in most observational studies. Because what those statistics are fundamentally based on is the idea that you have an unbiased estimator. In observational data, we know we don't have an unbiased estimator. In fact, we know we have a biased estimator. The issue isn't about p-values, which are almost always wrong. The issue is about understanding systematic error, which is the fundamental problem that basically our traditional statistics just ignore. And one of the things we found was we could calibrate this stuff to start to make some insights. And so we learned technically, and I'll just provide some papers in case people are interested in reading more of what I'm talking about. We found that there is opportunity in observational data, but there's a lot of challenges that we still as a community need to overcome. Now what I'm going to talk a little bit about though is that generating evidence is not just a data analysis or technology problem. One of the things we realize probably more, important, more importantly than anything is that we need different perspectives coming to this, to this table. We need people from industry and academia and government working together. We need people from informatics and epidemiology and statistics and clinical sciences. We need to be able to come up with, and Ian was actually getting at this in part of the we need to actually think about not just how do we come up with a, a nice algorithm or a nice paper, but we actually have to figure out how we're going to push our new technologies into adoption that get used in clinical practice. So we need to be able to do things that are, are accessible to the community. And one of the things that we recognized in all of our work was that this is a massive problem. You know, uh, no one institution, maybe University of Calgary could do it, but no other institution I've been to, uh, is going to be able to solve the fact that greater than 90% of clinical questions are, are left unanswered right now. Nobody's going to be able to solve the problem of that we fundamentally are missing a foundational type of statistics that doesn't exist. So we have to be able to build a community to bring people together. And that's what actually really motivated us to develop Odyssey. Uh, we have created an open community that's doing open science to collaborate on trying to develop open source analytics for observational studies and to apply them to real questions that, that matter to patients and providers. The coordinated center is based at Columbia University where I sit on Fridays, but to be very clear, this is an open invitation. This is open to anybody in the world to participate. If you, you all like to, just talk, talk to me after the talk. Our mission is to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. Sounds like mom and apple pie, or what would it be here? Poutine? Um, uh, but uh, fundamentally what we realize is there actually aren't very many places where you can actually get together and collaborate on developing evidence. Um, actually, I thought that the, the introductory comments were important that you, know, you guys are thinking about potentially br branching out within Alberta, and I just want to put the challenge, like, why don't you branch out to the rest of the world? Why aren't you collaborating with folks uh, in the U.S. and in the U.K. and the rest of Europe in the Asia-Pacific region? Um, we're all trying to solve the same fundamental problem, which is how to make patients' lives better. So um, uh, Bill actually mentioned um, uh, in, in a comment that you made there about uh, when we think about big data, one of the things that's missing is the use cases. And so one of the things that we've been driven by in Odyssey is first to find the use cases. What are the problems that we want to solve? And so I'm just classifying them here. We think about clinical characterization. So I want to answer questions about disease natural history. You know, who are the patients that have diabetes? What do they look like? What are their co comorbidities? What are their concomitant medications? I want to answer questions about population level estimation. So this might be safety surveillance. Does a drug cause a side effect? It could be comparative effectiveness research. Does one drug, is one drug better than another for a particular outcome? And I also want to think about patient level prediction where I'm going to specifically define this if we want to use the buzzword of, of precision medicine. What I really want to talk about is at the moment that I'm faced with making a decision, can I predict the likelihood that something's going to happen to me in the future? based on everything that you know about me in the past. Uh, I want to decouple the notion that precision medicine equals genomics, because we've actually ignored the opportunity to explore phenotypic data to fit predictive models. Now, I don't know whether observational data is going to be able to solve all of these questions, but what I want to know is where is observational data fit on this, this continuum, and where can we actually say the data are not sufficient to answer these questions? And that's what we are trying to focus on within Odyssey. So how do we actually do that? Well, we've, we really have three kind of, uh, actually I like the term pillars, I'll use that. Three pillars that we're focused on. We think about methodologic research. So how do we actually develop and evaluate algorithms that we can apply to observational data? We think about open source analytics development. So how do we develop software that we can make freely available that takes the best practices that we learn from the methodologic research and makes them available to an entire community? 
And then we focus on evidence generation. We find real questions that matter to real patients, and we apply the best practices through open source software across the community to try to generate evidence that would be useful. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, in the time, time we've got together, go through some specific examples of that. Um, I'm just putting this, this continuum on this, this scale here to say there's our use cases down, down the, uh, the side there, clinical characterization, estimation, and prediction, and there's kind of our pillars. I want you to be overwhelmed by the fact that, geez, that's an awful lot of stuff that needs to be done. Because no one person, no one department, no one institution could tackle all of this stuff. And yet I'd be really hard pressed for any of you to tell me which part of this is not necessary. No, we need to be able to establish best practices. We need to develop new statistical algorithms. We need statisticians who can come up with those ideas. But we need some computer scientists who can take those ideas and, and turn Greek formulas written on a white paper into code that someone can actually execute. And we need to be able to bring that directly in the clinic so that when you are treating patients uh, in the hospital, you actually have the evidence at your disposal. So I want to highlight a few different areas, although I'm going to actually ignore the ones that I had originally planned for. Um, so first, because Evan was mentioning um, open community standards, I want to talk about how we think about open community standards as one approach. Importantly and deliberately, these are open community standards, meaning everything I'm showing you here has been developed by and for a community, and it's a continuously evolving process so that if you see something and say, hey, I'd like to get involved in that, come on, come on along. One of the things we've done is developed a common data model. Very, very simple construct. Everybody's got different types of observational data, whether it be administrative claims, electronic health records, clinical registries, and everybody's data looks and feels different. If we're gonna run large-scale analysis, we need to be able to standardize on the structure and the content of those databases. And so out of necessity, we had established a common data model as a representation of that. That data model evolved through community contribution to think about specific analytic use cases that wanted to be supported. This is just a cartoon of that common data model. Basically, every box represents a table. That table has a defined set of fields and data types. And there are conventions established by the community for how you would take your uh, Alberta Providence uh, uh, administrative claims data and put it into this model. Or whether you've got the electronic health record from the hospital right here you want to put in this model. There are conventions for how you do that. Now, importantly, there are sections within this data model that contain person-level clinical data. So you have information about a person, you have when are they in the database for, you might capture specimens, you might have every time they go to a visit, and at those visits, what happens? What procedures are administered? What diagnoses are reported? What drugs are they exposed to? You might have other measurements such as laboratory tests. You may have free text notes like what Evan was showing you at Stanford. Some data sources have information about the healthcare system, which is the apparatus that is providing that information. Some systems have health economics information. We standardize as a community conventions for how to derive specific type of types of information. And underlying all of this is that we have a standardized vocabulary. So Ian mentioned the, the idea that in the UK they've been using James Reed's codes forever. Uh, and that's great. It works really well in the UK. Nobody else outside of the UK uses the Reed codes. In the United States, we, we were reluctantly sticking to ICD-9 until October of last year. Now we're so excited that we finally moved on to ICD-10, and now we've got Bill and Huda working on ICD-11, so we're already like <laughs> a and a half behind. Uh, we've got other data sources that are totally using different vocabularies. If we can't speak the same language across our databases, we have no chance being able to ask questions in a consistent way. So part of what this data model does is not only standardize the structure, but also is going to harmonize the content for us to be able to ask similar questions everywhere. Now importantly, this one data model supports multiple different use cases. So my research interest is in drug safety surveillance, but others in the community are doing device surveillance. Other people are doing vaccine research. Some people are doing comparative effectiveness research. Other people are doing health economics research. Other people are supporting quality of care. Some people are actually using clinical research. The important thing here is that, unlike our current paradigm, which is one person's got one question, they go get their one data set, put it in one place, and they start to munge on it. Here we're talking about a foundation to create one structure that everybody can use as a shared resource, whether that be within your own institution or across a community network. So um, this is a, a map of all the folks that are working in Odyssey. Right now we have 140 researchers, 
in 20 different countries. And when I show that data model, there are over 50 databases that have been converted to that data model, and it represents 660 million patients. Now, every single one of those databases started with a conversation that said, yeah, but my data is different. My data can't conform to your standards. I've got special, special sauce in my data. And every one of them, and I'm sure that uh, later this afternoon we're going to have the exact same conversation because I'm sure your data is the one that's special. Um, uh, but, the, but the important thing is if you, have, you kind of have a choice. If you want to be special and you want to be individual and you want to be alone, you can do that. Or you can join a community effort where what you're really trying to do is think about the, the quality of the whole and aggregate. And what we found is actually a lot of people are concerned about the loss that they lose when they're no longer an individual, but actually what they gain in terms of improving standards, improving convention, uh, conventions, improving their processing uh, far outweighs any risk that they somehow are no longer special. So um, this is where I'm going to just totally jump off track here. I want to show two things here because Ian uh, prompted me and also Evan did. So I hope this works. All right, I am showing you right here a software tool written by Odyssey, freely available. Anybody could download this and run it on their own data. I'm showing you, um, this is a database <coughs> profile that's showing me, in this case, a database called the Truven CCAE database. It's a database of 120 million lives. It's got, uh, you know, what are 50-50 breakdown in gender. Uh, in the United States, people uh, switch over to Medicare after they turn 65, so that's why you see that this database doesn't have people after 65. We've got various information. I can summarize everything that's in that data model through this, this, this tool. So for example, I could go look at uh, conditions, and this crazy tree map is basically showing you the prevalence of every single code in the database. So I'm showing you here, what is that? Acute pharyngitis, 14% of people have this disease. Uh, and when they have it, they get, on average, two codes uh, per person. And if I drill down on that, I can see things like, what is the prevalence of pharyngitis over time here by year, by age, by gender, uh, et cetera. Now, I wanted to go up to diabetes. So I'm just going to search on diabetes to show you what the prevalence in the United States of diabetes, this diabetes code, looks like we can see a pattern that actually looks remarkably similar to one of the slides that Ian showed, where he showed uh, in CPRD, it was from like 2000 to 2005, it kind of looked like a steady trail, but depending on which UK database you had, it was slightly different prevalence. Well, you kind of see that, like that, that nice pattern there, you know, men, oh, come on. Oh. We got men that, uh, men are more likely than women to have diabetes, older more likely than younger, and it seems to be increasing over time. Now, where I want to pick on Ian a little bit is Ian's graph was rather convenient. I'm going to go to CPRD. Now, remember, CPRD, UK database, totally different vocabulary, but because we've standardized both of those databases in the common data model, I can ask the exact same question. I can say, what's going on with diabetes? And I can click on diabetes, and drum roll, please, let's look at the prevalence of diabetes. All right, let me actually, I'll, I'll, I'll start on this graph. So this is, again, over, uh, over years. Um, and we can see men, men more than women, older more than younger. But then there's this crazy spike. And I want to scroll down to show you, here's the prevalence of diabetes by month. And Ian's graph conveniently <laughs> covered 2000 to 2005, which is this, I'm just picking on you, Ian. Um, just gave you this part that kind of looks like a normal thing. But in 2006, there's this crazy spike. Was it lo and behold that in the UK there was this dramatic uh, rise of diabetes that happened? I know, I know that Ian knows the story, so let me just ask. Anybody have a hypothesis of what happened here? Overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis? Then More visits. More visits? Just right, right then, just in the middle of, middle of 2006. Somehow, everybody in the UK is like, let's go to the doctor. It's 2006. Time for diabetes. Yes? There's some kind of spike in technology or something that would capture data more. That's a good hypothesis. So like, there could be a technology spike. Maybe like the coding system might have changed. ICD-10. They introduced ICD-10. The introduction of ICD-10. That, that's an interest. So if you change the vocabulary, that could happen. Sure. Any other ideas? Reimbursement? Reimbursement. So what happened was, 
doctors in the, the UK were given a little bit of extra money for every number of patients that they had who had diabetes. <laughs> so lo and behold, what happened was, not to say that, I, don't, I want to be very clear, not to say that those people, uh, uh, they fraudulently put in a whole bunch of diabetics in the system, but they weren't capturing the, all of the diabetes before. And when they were told, I'm going to get paid if I'm going to actually put my diabetes in, sure enough, they went back through and, and entered in all the ones that had diabetes, but they just didn't bother to write it down. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. There are dozens, I think the last time I counted like four dozen, papers about diabetes in the UK that are published in really, really good journals. I've yet to find one who says, oh, by the way, when you plot the data over time, you got this little blip. Right. Now, maybe that doesn't matter for your research question, but I can imagine lots and lots and lots of reasons why that could matter a heck of a lot. And at a minimum, wouldn't you like to at least know that that's happening in your data? Now, when I talk about standards, we are not normalizing this out. We're not making that blip go away. What we're doing is we're providing a common way for us to look at the data and actually see whether or not a pattern exists. So, a pattern exists. Be careful if you're working in the UK. <laughs> All right, sorry for that. Departure or the other one. Oh, um, who's been working with Evan on the PKB definition for diabetes here? They're at Stanford. They're all at Stanford, okay, good. So I'm gonna pick on them now. <laughs> All right, so um, it's interesting because what does a common data model allow you to do? It allows a community of people to write common analytics that could then run against the database. So, um, for example, one, oops, that's not what I want to do. I want to go, let's go over here. Um, for example, one could write a web user interface that allows the computer to write the SQL for you to answer questions through a point and click experience. <coughs> so for example, that VKB type 2 diabetes definition, if I clicked on that, we can see a user interface experience that takes the logic from VKB and enters in that a person has to have either a diagnosis or a drug, can't have a type 1 diabetes code, uh, has to have at least one description, uh, prescription, must have a HbA1c value. What we're doing here is we're specifying a formalism for that VKB definition. And if I wanted to spend weeks to write the SQL code, I could, or I could just click a button and get the SQL code written in whatever database platform you wanted, whether that be SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, Redshift, etc. And you could just copy and paste and run it, or you could spend a couple weeks writing code, whichever you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> just the best, just the best. So um, now, now the thing is, what I'm showing you here is massively hard to do. University of Calgary, Stanford, nobody's going to build a system like this all by themselves. But we're not one organization or one individual. We are a community because what we recognize is not only do we need to write this kind of software, but we needed somebody, a cl clinical person, to take that VKB definition and develop this algorithm. We need somebody else to do the computer science underneath of it to make that show SQL button pop up. We need somebody else to interpret the data. That's what a community is all about, is everybody brings their little bit of expertise to the table, and you can work on it together to solve some important problems. So why I'm very bullish about this idea that an open community is the way to go, and that all of you as individuals, and University of Calgary as an institution, should be participating in this kind of effort, is because you are going to be left behind if you don't, and if you do, you're going to get substantially more value than you could ever get on your own. I was going to say I was going to get off the soapbox, but I'm not. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to get on Jim's question uh, about um, uh, differences in data sets. So um, I mentioned clinical characterization. I want to talk about treatment pathways for a second. So how many folks here are familiar with diabetes research just in general? Show of hands. Okay. So. I'll, I'll just mention uh, very briefly, this is the American Diabetes Association's guidelines for treatment of diabetes as it relates to drugs. And basically in diabetes right now, there is one agreed first line therapy, which is called metformin. And then there's a whole bunch of second line drugs that are available called sulfonylureas, uh, TZDs, DPP4s, SGLT2s, et cetera, lots of different drugs. And if you read the, gu the guidelines, these are the, the guidelines that clinicians are supposed to be following, it basically says, we have pretty good evidence to support the idea that metformin should be your first treatment. But for your second treatment, I wish I actually put the quote on it. says, there have been no clinical trials that tell us a head-to-head -head comparison of these alternative second-line treatments. So just pick one that you think is good for you. So basically, what's happening in diabetes care is everybody's supposed to start, start on metformin. 
and then, there's a, and then if that form is not working for them, they can take any of these other treatments and hopefully those work. So uh, just interested, so that's what the guideline, that's what uh, doctors are told they should do. So let me ask you all a question. What treatments do patients in Canada actually use for their diabetes? Let's just stick to diabetes. How many people here know what diabetics in Canada are actually doing today? Anybody have even a guess? Okay, I don't know either, because you guys aren't part of Odyssey. Um, but what I am going to show you is I do know this answer for many parts of the rest of the world. Why? Because we wrote a standardized analytics and asked the simple question. We asked what are patients actually taking? Not rocket science, but we want to do it. So how did we do that, first of all, before I show you the results? Well, we used this Odyssey community as a network to ask a research question. Basically what happens was people join the community, you all can join, you can propose a research question. You basically just say, here's an idea of something you want to do. You write a protocol to specify what you're going to do. You write code that runs against the common data model that's going to execute the protocol. You make it publicly available for all the world to see. We invite the world to participate. Everybody is a, a, a volunteer to be able to do that. We share results without ever passing along patient level information, just only aggregate summary statistics. And then we collaborate to publish papers, because some people like publishing papers. So this study I'm about to show you, um, I'll speak with a little bit of immodesty. Um, this is going to be one of the biggest observational studies you're ever going to see. And it started with four of us sitting in a bar at AMIA on November 15th, 2014. And three weeks later, we had results of one of the largest studies ever done from seven different databases with full transparency to protocol, source code, tested, and run around the world. Uh, finally, the, the paper, which actually has come out, I think, this week, is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And it shows results from all of these different participating data partners. We had results from multiple sites in the US, in the UK, Japan, Hong Kong, uh, Netherlands, I think, is on there too, South Korea. Um, all of these different databases, different sources, different geographies are all able to participate in this one simple question, what do patients with diabetes actually do? So here's what pe people with diabetes actually do. What I'm showing you here is a sunburst visualization. And what I'll instruct you how to, to interpret this. Think of this first row in here is the first treatment that everybody with, with people with diabetes get. In this particular case, this big chunk of green, that actually is metformin. 75% of people, their first treatment that they take is metformin, which is great because the clinical guideline says that's what you should be able to do. Interesting question, what the heck about those other 25%? Why are they not following the guidelines? But one problem at a time. <laughs> um, we, we followed these patients for over three years longitudinally, so we could ask the question, if they stopped taking metformin, what treatment did they go on to? And what we learned was over three years, 30% of those metformin users stayed on metformin. Metformin worked pretty good for a large fraction of the people who uh, had type 2 diabetes. But amongst those who they couldn't stick for, this second loop here represents the second treatment that these patients had. So here's some people, uh, what is that, 8% took lamepuride, 6% took libozide, another 5% took some other drug I can't pronounce, uh, citagliptin, uh, pioglizone, etc. Now what you can see is happening is the guideline says that you all got to take one drug first, and most people did, and then the guideline says, I don't know what you should do for a second treatment, and sure enough, kind of almost at random, all those second line treatments are used. Now what you can see is there's a third line treatment there, and then there's a fourth line, and some of these patients actually had 20 different distinct diabetes treatments over the course of three years. Now, um, this is an aggregation from all of those databases, but what I want to actually show you is three different databases. So, I know this is a lot to look at, but just look at this first column here on the left-hand side. So type 2 diabetes. This first database up here is the Truven Market Scan CCAE. It's a US claims database. The second database here is CPRD, the one that Ian was showing you lots of stuff for. Third database here is the Japan Medical Data Center. Let's just talk about diabetes for a second. So here's three different populations, and Jim's question about our database is similar. Well, if you look at them, those, those circles certainly don't look an awful lot alike. A couple interesting things that we observed. Um, well, let's start with CPRD. You notice it's got this, what color would you call that? Like that light green color is kind of the prevalent second line treatment in the CPRD. And that light green color doesn't even show up in the US or Japan. What the heck's going on there? Anybody have any hypotheses? 
drugs not available in that country? Drugs not available in that country, that's right. So it turns out there's a drug called glicoside, which is only approved in the UK. It's a sulfonylurea. In the US, we use other sulfonylureas. Ian actually showed a really nice graph where he was showing in the UK, um, he called it actually just metformin plus sulfonylurea was his first line in the hazard plot, and then metformin versus T, uh, DBB4s and SGLT2s. Well, he marked it as sulfonylureas because if he had written it down as metformin plus glicoside, everybody in the US would have read this and said, what the hell is that? Um, because we don't have it in the United States. Um, now, there's an assumption that's made, well, maybe we can exchange information between the UK and the US because they are both sulfonylureas. But we're making an assumption that two drugs that belong to the same class somehow have the same experience. That is an untested and untestable hypothesis given that this drug is only in the UK and we don't have it in the US. Now, interesting in the JMDC, uh, you see that, that metformin is not being used as first-line therapy with the same prevalence. Um, we're still actually investigating why this is, but one of the things we found is that there are two uh, analogs for metformin in, the, in Japan. One's called metformin and one's called fenformin, and they're similar products. But what happens is when you give doctors a cho when you tell doctors you have only one choice, it's pretty easy to just keep doing that. When you tell doctors you have to make a choice of two things, we find that, well, now if you've given me freedom, I'm going to make multiple choices. And so what we actually think happens there is that there's less enforcement of a clinical guideline because of the fact that choice is introduced. Now, this interesting pattern here in diabetes, the thing is that we were able to systematically apply the same exact idea to multiple disease states. We did this for hypertension and we did this for depression, but we could have done this for any disease and any set of treatments. And, but in all three of these cases, we saw wild differences between the different populations. Um, we saw differences in, in trends of data sets over time. And one, one other big insight that I want to share with you as it relates to your organizational excitement about precision medicine. Uh, how many people have heard, like with, with bluster and excitement, the term, we're just going to study patients like me? How many people have heard this phrase bandied about? All right, so uh, at least in the US and a lot of meetings that I go to, everyone's like, precision medicine is all about studying patients like me. If I could just go find the patients like me, then I could learn something more personalized to my care. Really fascinating thing that we learned, um, I should have mentioned up front, this study was done in over 250 million patient records. Um, ultimately, once we applied these very strict inclusion criteria, we were down to a few hundred thousand in each of these treatment states. Very, very big data. And yet, in the case of diabetes and uh, depression, there were 10% of the population had a treatment sequence that was completely unique to that individual. I want you to think about what that means. 10% of people, one in 10 of you in this room, have an experience unlike anybody else who we saw in the rest of the world. So if you talk about patients like me, for 10% of the people with diabetes and depression, there is nobody like you. You are yourself unique and special in all sorts of wonderful ways. We have a very real tension between wanting to study average treatment effects, which would be like what's going to happen amongst all people who take second line treatments, and wanting to study precision medicine and, and tailor something down to an individual. In the case of hypertension, there's a lot of different treatments, a lot of choices that providers and patients have to be able to make, and they're all very good, and some of them even have clinical reasons why one might be preferred over another. And yet what we saw across, I think it was like 250,000 patients, is that 25% of patients had a completely unique sequence. One in four hypertensive patients, if you follow them for three years, and you look at what treatments are they taking, they were taking a unique sequence of ingredients. Unique to them, no other patient had that sequence. It's pretty staggering. Now, if you aggregate things up and you just make the assumption that all sulfonylureas are created equal, it's not necessarily as extreme. But if we're thinking about precision medicine, we've got to get real about what we mean about precision medicine. Are we, we're trying to get away from an average treatment effect across all people with diabetes, because I think this proves that all people with diabetes aren't the same. But on the flip side, you can't just say, well, I'm going to study an individual person and try to understand what's going on there. You know, got you so far? We've got a couple heads going up and a couple are like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Time. Well, I'm going to go through this one super quick because I want to follow, follow up with a, a one that's actually quite personal to me. So I want to talk about this, this notion that Evan brought up about open science. 
So our idea of open science is not open, open source software, which is what a lot of people hear when they hear open science, they think it's open source software. What we would say is that open science is the path we want to take to generate evidence, which requires data and analytics and domain expertise. Open source software is simply an enabler to accomplish this open science. So open source software is both common standard data models, uh, analytics that are freely available, but it's really about having a community who actually has the interest in working together. Part of the thing that we've learned is that in order to speak the same language in data, we also have to speak the same language in terms of the research process that we're going to follow. So one of the things we're working on right now as a community is we're trying to standardize workflows for how we do research. So let me take a very simple question like population level estimation. <clears throat> is intervention X better than intervention Y for condition Z? If we could actually define as a community, what are the appropriate steps to follow to get a valid answer to this question? Well, if we could do that, then we could engineer a defined set of inputs that require clinical expertise and epidemiologic understanding to be able to define those inputs. And then we could use computer scientists and informaticists to build solutions that will yield consistent outputs. That means the same work product will be produced every time we follow this process. The idea here is that we want to separate out the stuff that's kind of the custom clinical, maybe more artsy than sciencey kind of side of things, from what should actually just be a very tactical thing that we can perform in a reproducible, consistent, transparent manner. So as an example of this, actually I'll just show it right here real quick. Um, the FDA, in their infinite wisdom, started doing um, something I actually think is quite useful. They created this website where they basically communicate when they've identified a safety issue that they don't know whether or not it's real or not. And they just put it out there and say, hey, we're worried about this problem, but we don't know whether it's real or not. And so they have this website, and they list all of these issues. So they've got all these drugs and what the potential signal is. And they report these every three months. So um, Ian was mentioning SGLT2 inhibitors. So here's looking at that class and whether or not they cause kidney injury is a kind of a question. Well, we were looking through this list, and we saw this question about Kepra, which is a treatment for epilepsy, and whether or not it causes angioedema. And it says that the FDA is evaluating the need for regulatory action. Now the thing is, I don't know anything about epilepsy, I don't know anything about Kepra, I certainly can't pronounce that generic ingredient name. Um, but I know a systematic process for how I would think about answering a question like that. And part of the reason why the FDA doesn't know the answer to this is because these are drugs that while they're used pretty fairly prevalently, we're talking about a pretty rare adverse event. We need a ton of data to be able to even think about answering this. So as a community, one of the things that we're doing is we've just said, hey, the FDA's got a question. Why don't we try to help them? We posed a protocol. This, this is just out on the Odyssey website. You all can go read it if you want. Here's a protocol that you can just download to read about a standardized way for us to answer a question about uh, Kepra versus uh, a comparator treatment we use, which is phenytoin. Um, and uh, not only did we release the protocol, this is before we've ever done, I'm not going to show you results because we haven't even done it yet. We released the protocol to the world saying we're going to do this study and we posted, this is our GitHub repository with all of our source code, we posted study protocols, we posted the code for this study out on our website. If you guys are R programmers, you can go out and download this R code and run a study. Now I've got a ton of grief for this because people are like, are you crazy? You're going to get scooped. I've just posted my research idea, I've posted my code, and I've invited the world to do this study, and I'm going to lose my chance to get my paper published in JAMA that will be refuted a month later. <laughs> um, and actually we've even seen this pushback within the Odyssey communities. Like people are like, eh, I'm not so sure I want to share this. And my, my point is, who, who, who are you losing out to if you get scooped? If somebody gets the answer to this question, and it helps the next patient who has epilepsy and is making a treatment, we all win. As a community, we're trying to help patients. So, you know what? I'd love for someone to scoop me. I'd love for you guys. If you guys, you guys got data, I want you to scoop me. Run this study and publish the results. Even better, run this study and share the results with the rest of the world who's also going to run this study so that we won't just have one answer from Calgary, but we'll have a collection of answers from around the world. And I don't have results to show for you because we just kicked this off last week. All right, I'm going to take five more minutes. So that's okay. All right. 
So last thing that I want to show is quite personal to me. Um, I want to talk about how we can think about evidence being disseminated to be useful. So uh, Evan mentioned that um, I am a proud new papa. That is my baby girl, Catherine. Uh, Catherine um, uh, had a bit of a rock, rocky start to her life. She was born six weeks early, and we found out that she had cardiovascular complications that was requiring us to think about lots of pretty invasive treatments, which for a little teeny baby girl is really hard. And this was over Christmas, and the only person who could get a special uh, viewing inside of the NICU was Santa Claus, but the rest of the family had to sit out in the hallway. So <laughs> it was a pretty trying time for us. Um, so I was, you know, for taking all my research aside, I actually got to take two months off of work, and I spent most of it sitting in this room, staring at this uh, intensive care unit, staring at my baby girl, and trying to figure out what I can do to make her life better. Now, um, lots of things happened that I'm not going to bore you with the stories for, but one of the things that happened was one of the, the perks of having a preemie child with cardiovascular issues is that they get to use a lot of exotic treatments on you because you're a high, very high-risk child. One of the treatments that they gave us um, once we were be, about to be discharged was this treatment called pavlizumab, or Synergis, which is a treat, it's an antibody to reduce the risk of getting RSV disease. And they handed me this little pamphlet here, uh, which I'm showing you on the screen there. And in the pamphlet, it says selected safety information, other possible effectiveness. It says, go ahead and read the product label. So the product label's back here, and I pulled out the product label. And have you guys ever actually read a product label? This is a joke, right? <laughs> so I'm reading the product label. Um, I'm reading the product label. In the very first part, just so you can see it, it says, anaphylaxis has been reported. Uh, so where is it? Where is it on here? Yeah, there we are. Anaphylaxis, including fatal cases, have been reported. That's what this thing says. So my baby girl, who's being told that she, we should inject this into her, I'm told that, don't worry, that there's not a safety problem. And actually, here was the quote from my doctor. The doctor said, this paper says there are side effects, but I've never seen them happen. <laughs> that was what the doctor told me, OK? Now, um, I could have just accepted that and said, OK, go ahead and shoot her up. Um, or I could think about what would real world evidence actually do to help my daughter. And so, uh, as, as every concerned parent in the NICU does, I ran home and started writing SQL code. <laughs> I actually ran an analysis on my data, across my data network, to figure out how many children do I actually have in this data set, how many are newborns, and in fact I had many million children in, across multiple databases in the US. And for that I could find how many of those children actually got this drug. And it turns out that while I had millions of, of children uh, in my database, because this is for the select few who are very at high risk. There was only a couple thousand patients who were actually exposed to this drug in the treatment. But then I could find those people who were exposed and then ask, how many of them actually had anaphylaxis? Now, this isn't rocket science here. I'm just asking that when this thing says that, that my baby might die, I want to know is that if that's one in 10, I sure as heck am not going to give it to my, patient, give it to my daughter. If it's one in 100, I'm probably not going to. If it's one in 1,000, I might think about it. If it's one in 10,000, you know what? This treatment might actually make some good sense. So I ran the analysis and figured out that this, uh, the risk is actually somewhere in the one in a 10,000 kind of range for children that look like Catherine. Now here's the interesting thing about that. Um, what the, when the doctor said, don't worry, I've never seen it happen, I just did some back of the envelope calculations to go, what does that mean? And even in the best of circumstances, if that doctor had seen almost all of the cases of children like Catherine for the last several years, it's highly likely that, he, that that doctor had probably seen less than 50 kids like Catherine. So there's a very high chance that they could say, I've never seen the event, even though the event might be one in 100, or even more than that. Um, so here's a case where I don't want a doctor's anecdote. And I sure as heck don't want this piece of paper who says, there are some fatal cases reported. I want evidence that tells me what is the chance that this is actually going to happen. And so, as any concerned parent would do, I wrote code to do that. But it's kind of a shame to think that that's what would need, be needed to be done. Why can't this piece of paper give me real world evidence and say that rate is 1 in 10,000? That would help me make my decision. So, um, I'm going to show this very briefly and then I'll shut up. Um, one of the things we are working on within Odyssey is how do we disseminate the evidence we generate directly to the patient? So rather than this stupid product label that's almost useless, what if we could actually embed the real world evidence inside of a product label? 
So I've clicked here, what drug did I just pick? Pioglitazone, that's one of those diabetes treatments. So this is that product label. This is that exact same text as, as this thing, all the way down with all the sections. But you'll notice there's a whole lot of hyperlinks. One of the things we're trying to do is systematically embed evidence that we generate into the product label. So that it doesn't just say, hey, watch out, uh, pioglitazone causes what? Heart failure. But you can actually click on heart failure, and you can see in the real world data, in that CCAE population, I can see how many patients are um, here, how many patients are, have taken pioglitazone? So what's my real world experience? And there's 800,000 of them. I could look at to see, let's see, we're still loading here. Uh, I could actually see if this ever popped up, an incidence rate, here we go, uh, heart failure for this drug. We can actually see that the incidence rate is seven per thousand. Now, I don't know whether 7 per 1,000 is good or bad. It's just a different. But at least I got the answer. This thing sure as heck doesn't give me the answer. One of the things we're trying to do as a community is collaboratively think about not just how can we generate evidence, but how do we make sure that the evidence is reliable. And then once we've got that evidence that's reliable, how can we actually disseminate it to providers and patients so that they can actually make better decisions with their care? So with that, I'm going to shut up. Um, I will conclude by saying, what Odyssey means to me when I show this Chevron is it's not just a bunch of abstract things. I'm interested in answering questions like, where's the reliable data about the health of children? Which children are going to be exposed to this nasty drug? Does that drug actually cause anaphylaxis in newborns? And will my daughter be the one who's going to develop anaphylaxis? These are the questions that matter to me, and this is what inspires me to, to focus on Odyssey, and what makes me recognize that we need to work as a community, because these are my questions from my experience over the last couple months. I'm sure all of you have questions that you care deeply about, and it, together we could actually work to solve some of those questions. Concluding thoughts, I rambled, and things are good. <laughs> and most importantly, Catherine is healthy and happy and good and the cutest little thing ever. Uh, if anybody's interested in joining what we're doing, I'd be happy to chat with you, and you can contact me on, on email there. So thank you very much.